Well, I had been interested um, in one of the characters in the book, William Huell, since graduate school, so for years. And I was writing a book about Huell's debate with John Stuart Mill, the famous British philosopher. And in the course of my research in Cambridge, I was going through the correspondence of Huell, and I saw in a letter a reference to philosophical breakfast that had been held in Herschel's rooms, in John Herschel's rooms, that Huell was at, and also Charles Babbage. And I thought to myself, well, that's really interesting, because as far as I knew, no one had ever placed those three men in the same room at the same time. Really? That is, people knew Huell was at Cambridge, Herschel was at Cambridge, Charles Babbage was at Cambridge, but I'd never seen anyone mention that they knew each other and that they were at Cambridge at the same time. And I just thought it would be fascinating to examine um, what they were like as a group, um, as well as a, a fourth friend of theirs, John uh, Richard Jones, um, and, and to see whether as a group they really were more than the sum of their parts. Um, and I found in the course of my research there was this incredible synergy between them. And together they really were able to make you know, vast societal changes um, to the notion of science and how science was conducted that individually they wouldn't have been able to do. Um, so I, I had this idea for some years brewing in the back of my mind that it would be wonderful to write a book about them. And then I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to do it. It was a lot of fun. Um, I always wanted to be a writer, actually. Um, the academic thing came much later. Right. Uh, and so it was wonderful to get to use uh, the skills I've gained you know, as a researcher, as an academic, and then go back to really my dream of writing a book that you could find in the library, in the bookstore. Um, so that's, uh, that was fun, but it was a challenge um, you know, to write in, a, in an accessible way. What's fun about that is it's a challenge that I, I saw um, becoming more difficult for scientists at the end of the period that I'm writing about in the Philosophical Breakfast Club. That is, uh, one of the themes of that book is how important it is for uh, scientists or natural philosophers, as they were called first, to be able to communicate their results to a broader audience. Um, and in a way, that's what I was trying to do with this book. Uh, so it was a challenge that was uh, both a lot of fun and also, I think, important. Uh, I think historians can play a role in bringing science to a broader audience, um, as well as scientists themselves. I would say don't lose the ability to talk to people about what you're doing. You know, as they go on and on um, and become scientists and get more involved in the very technical and even arcane details of their research, I would say if you could teach them to always be able to explain what they're doing to their parents, uh, even if they're not the curies, you know, or their friends. Um, and I think one problem with the career of, of science right now is um, there's an, an idea that being able to communicate what you're doing to a broader audience is dumbing down in right. some way. It's, it diminishes you to do that as a scientist. Mm. I like to think of it as not really dumbing down, but educating up, um, mm. you know, bringing a, a broader audience up to uh, the uh, the level of being able to understand what you're doing. I mean, it's what we do as teachers, mm. um, right? Take our research and we present it to students in a way they could understand, and that's not dumbing down, that's teaching. Mm. Um, so I would hope that scientists could start to see it more as part of their job to teach the public about what they do. Um, you know, it would be good if there could be institutional changes that would enable that to happen. Sure. You know don't get tenure uh, as a scientist at a university for writing popular articles about what they're doing or op-ed pieces mm -hmm. for the New York Times. Um, and so maybe younger scientists could work to change that somehow uh, from within uh, the system. I'm so gratified by the response I've had, really. Um, you know, even just having you interested in talking to me now after the book's been out for so long, it's, mm. it's just a joy to me. Um, I, I think what's, what's been 
really wonderful to me is that um, both scientists and people who think of themselves as not at all interested in science mm. have come to the book and, and have enjoyed the book. And at first I thought the, these different groups were finding different things that they liked about the book, you sure. know, that the scientists were liking the science content and the history of their fields. And the people who say, I'm not really that interested in science, were liking the human element of the book and the friendship relationships but actually from talking to people now when I give give lectures around or get emails from from readers um, I feel that both groups really enjoy the same aspect about the book which is that it shows science not segregated from the rest of society in a little capsule mm. um, you know, or ivory tower uh, but integrated into society and integrated into human relationships and I feel that both scientists and non-scientists enjoy that aspect of the book and that's been something that um, I'm really um, extremely happy about. I am writing another book now, which in an odd sort of way, um, thematically, is a prequel to this book. Sure. Um, it does go back in time uh, to the 17th century, but the way in which it's a prequel, and I just thought of this this morning, actually, um, is that, uh, you know, the, my book, The Philosophical Breakfast Club, opens with that scene where William Huell is inventing the word scientist mm, for yes. the first time, and kind of separating um, scientist from artist by inventing the word in analogy to artist. But what ends up happening is that then they become kind of separate realms. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the developments I talk about uh, in the book. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going back to a moment um, in the 17th century when the two fields are still very close together, mm -hmm. art and science. Okay. And in fact, is fully integrated into the rest of culture. And I'm looking particularly at um, a sea change that happened in the way of the notion of what it meant to see the world that occurred with the rise of optical technologies um, in the 17th century, microscopes and telescopes. Oh, and I'm going to explore that sea change both uh, in science, uh, particularly in the use of microscopes, and also in the art of the time, um, particularly in 17th century uh, Dutch art. Right. So so I, I'm, I'm very excited about the new project, and, and I think it will be fun to go back and look at this time yeah. where, you know, artists and scientists were talking together and um, were not really considering their uh, endeavors as vastly different. Yeah. You know, both to sort of represent the visible world and also the invisible world oh, in, a, in a way. You know, um, there are many. I uh, recently have been, um, I recently read Oliver Sacks' new book, Hallucinations. Mm -hmm. I mean, Oliver Sacks is a wonderful writer. I just love him because, um, you know, he's both a scientist and someone who writes so beautifully. So in a way, he's one of my uh, sort of literary heroes in being able to bring cutting edge research uh, to a broader public. And his new book, Hallucinations, is, is fascinating because he's really bringing history, psychology, philosophy, mm. um, as well as, you know, neurology to bear on this, this topic of sort of altered states of consciousness. Um, so that's a wonderful book. Um, I also have older, you know, books that I, that I love. Um, since you, you're going back to my book, um, there are other ones. Um, I loved, uh, this is quite old now, but I loved Davis Sobel's Galileo's Daughter. Okay. Uh, that's just a fabulous book, also about relationships mm -hmm. and um, how uh, you can see the integration of, of science and scientific thinking with um, very close personal relations. So, so that's a lovely book uh, right. as well. Well, the, the TED Talk was amazing. Um, it was a, a fabulous experience. And um, again, that was a, a moment where I was a little worried how uh, my story would be um, accepted and appreciated by this group of people who, you know, are, it turns out, amazing. You know, the, the 900 people that go to TED Global are such interesting, fascinating people. But, you know, they are used to hearing talks about inventions that are going to save two million lives. Mm. And so I thought, 
here I am telling this historical story. But again, um, you know, it, it, it's a story that resonates and they, they were very eager uh, to hear it and, and it was a wonderful audience. And then having the video put online has been wonderful um, because I've been hearing from a whole new sort of crop of readers and uh, people interested in the, in the um, topics covered in the book. So that's been, for me personally, that's been amazing. Thank you, George. I appreciate that.